Hey y'all, in today's video we're going to go over all of the new release thriller and horror books I'm looking forward to in May. Everyone buckle in, summer is right around the corner and that's when all of the highest book drops of the year usually happen around summer and then as we get into fall. If you are not subscribed and you enjoy these new release videos, I do this monthly so you can meet me back here on the first week of every month and we talk about all of the exciting new releases I'm looking forward to. So let's get into it. The first book I'm going to talk about released May the 1st. Let me know if y'all know the word that caught my attention. <laughs> this is Jess Keeler number one. So it is a series. I saw there are at least two books that are going to be released and this is by Eric Pruitt and it's called Something Bad Wrong. It says to catch the killer who eluded her detective grandfather 50 years ago, a true crime podcaster must contend with outdated evidence, ulterior motives, and the dark family secrets that got in the way. True crime podcaster Jess Keeler has returned to Deaton County, North Carolina to pick up where her grandfather left off. Sheriff's Deputy Big Jim Ballard, her grandfather, was a respected detective until it all came crashing down during a 1972 murder investigation. For Jim, solving the murders of two teens should have been the highlight of his already storied career. Instead, he battled his own mind, unsure where his hunches ended and the truth began. Working from her grandfather's disjointed notes, Jess is sure that she can finally put the cold case and her family's shame to rest. Enlisting the help of disgraced reporter Dan Decker, Jess soon discovers ugly truths about the first investigation, which was shaped by corruption, egos, and a family secret that may be the key to the crime. Told in a dual timeline that covers both investigations, Something Bad Wrong explores human folly, hubris, and how sometimes to solve a crime, you have to find out who's covering it up. Love it. What was the word, y'all? Podcaster! I love when there are podcasters, and usually they're true crime podcasters in the story. We are following two points of views, and that is 1972 Jim Ballard. As he's working on this investigation, which we see in present day, did not end well for him. In present day, we're going to be following his granddaughter as she's trying to get to the bottom of it. The next book's released on May the 2nd, and the first one is a cozy mystery slash urban fantasy read, and this is the first out of two novels this month that are taking a page from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. This one just seems so unique and with the urban fantasy. When I was a fantasy reader, urban fantasy was my jam. Give me the vampires, give me the werewolves, give me a big city. I lived for it. So this book is called Ukulele of Death by E.J. Copperman. It says, meet Fran and Ken Stein, a private investigator duo who refused to let a little thing like being not entirely human stop them from doing their jobs. After losing their parents, when they were just babies, private investigators Fran and Ken Stein now specialize in helping adoptees find their birth parents. So when a client asks them for help finding her father, with her only clue being a rare ukulele, the case is a little weird, sure, but it's nothing they can't handle. But soon, Fran and her brother are plunged into a world where nothing makes sense. And not just the fact that a very short, but very cute, NYPD detective keeps trying to take Fran out on dates. All Fran wants to do is find the ukulele and collect their fee. But it's hard to keep your focus when you're stumbling over corpses and receiving messages that suggest your dead parents are very much alive. Ukuleles aside, it's becoming clear that someone knows something they shouldn't, that Fran and Ken Stein weren't so much born as built. Love everything about that. 240 pages, love that even more. Next is The Ferryman by Justin Cronin, and this is a dystopian sci-fi novel, and he is actually the author of the acclaimed novel The Passage. It says, founded by the mysterious genius known as the designer, the archipelago of Prosperia lies hidden from the horrors of a deteriorating outside world. In this island paradise, Prospera's lucky citizens enjoy long fulfilling lives until the monitors embedded in their forearms meant to measure their physical health and psychological well-being fall below 10%. Then they retire themselves, embarking on a ferry ride to the island known as the nursery, where their failing bodies are renewed, their memories are wiped clean, and they are ready to restart life afresh. Proctor Bennett of the Department of Social Contracts has a satisfying career as a ferryman, gently shepherding people through their retirement process, and when necessary, enforcing it. But all is not well with Proctor. For one thing, he's been dreaming, which is supposed to be impossible in Prospera. For another, his monitor personage has begun to drop alarmingly fast. And then comes the day he is summoned to retire his own father, who gives him a disturbing and cryptic message before being wrestled onto the ferry. Meanwhile, something is stirring. The support staff 
ordinary men and women who provide the labor to keep Prospero running, have begun to question their place in the social order. Unrest is building and there are rumors spreading of a resistance group known as arrivalists who may be fomenting revolution. Soon Proctor finds himself questioning everything he once believed, entangled with a much bigger cause than he realized, and on a desperate mission to uncover the truth. The next book I think I'm most excited for, no, I know I am most excited for this book. Get ready, it's gonna be everywhere, and for good reason. I'm hopeful I can do a book talk on this this month, but it's Chain Gang All-Stars by Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya. This is a, another dystopian sci-fi novel that centers on two top women gladiators fighting for their freedom within a depraved private prison system not so far removed from America's own. Loretta Thuar and Hamara Hurricane Stack Stacker are the stars of Chain Gang All-Stars, the cornerstone of CAPE, also known as Criminal Action Penal Entertainment, a highly popular highly controversial, profit-raising program in America's increasingly dominant private prison industry. It's the return of the gladiators, and prisoners are competing for their ultimate prize, their freedom. In Cape, prisoners travel as links in chain gangs, competing in death matches for packed arenas with righteous protesters at the gates. Thuar and Stax, both teammates and lovers, are the fan favorites. And if all goes well, Thuar will be free in just a few matches, a fact she carries as heavily as her lethal hammer. As she prepares to leave her fellow Lynx, she considers how she might help preserve their humanity in defiance of these so-called games. But Cape's corporate owners will stop at nothing to protect their status quo, and the obstacles that lay in Thawar's path have devastating consequences. This last part is going to talk about the perspectives we'll be following. So it says, moving from the links in the field to the protesters to the Cape employees and beyond, Chain Gang All-Stars is the kaleidoscopic look at the American prison system's unholy alliance of systematic racism, unchecked capitalism, and mass incarceration, and a clear-eyed reckoning with what freedom in this country really means chills. I don't even want to get started on for-profit prison systems. There's so much wrong with a lot in this country. I'm just super excited to see what Nana Kwame has to give us. 384 pages, so not too long of a read. I'm scared. I saw some reviews and you know it's gonna be heartbreaking. You know that a lot of these characters are not gonna make it. I mean, they're fighting to the death. I'm sure it's gonna be a brutal read, but Oh gosh, it sounds incredible. The next books are releasing May 9th, and the first one is called Adrift by Lisa Brideau, and this is her debut mystery. So it's a mystery, but it might be a little sci-fi, or what would you, what genre would you classify this? Because it's our world, but not, I don't think. I didn't want to spoil myself too much on what's going on, but I do think there are a little bit of science fiction elements at play too. S wakes up alone on a sailboat in the remote Pacific Northwest with no memory of who she is or how she got there. She finds a note, but it's more warning than comfort. Start over. Don't make yourself known. Don't look back. She sails over a turbulent ocean to a town hundreds of miles away that she hopes might offer insight. The chilling clues she uncovers point to a desperate attempt at erasing her former life, but why? And someone is watching her, someone who knows she must never learn her truth. In S's world, the earth is precariously balanced at a climate tipping point, and she is perched at the edge of a choice. Which life does she want? The one taken from her, and the dangerous secret that was buried, or the new one she can make for herself. This book has some pretty positive reviews so far. S is a heroine that we can root for. She has a note that says, don't look back, don't dig too deep, go run. But instead of burying her head in the sand, it seems like S might be following her gut and trying to investigate what's really going on with her memory loss and everything surrounding that. Next up is The Graveyard of Lost Children by Katrina Monroe, and she's the author of They Drown Our Daughters. This is also a horror novel. Another one involving something or someone trying to drown children. At four months old, Olivia Dahl was almost murdered. Driven by haunting visions, her mother became obsessed with the idea that Olivia was a changeling and that the only way to get her real baby back was to make a trade with the dead woman living at the bottom of the well. Now Olivia is ready to give birth to a daughter of her own, and for the first time, she hears the woman whispering. Everyone tells Olivia she should be happy, she should be glowing, but the birth of her daughter only fills Olivia with dread. As Olivia's body starts giving out, slowly deteriorating as the baby eats and eats and eats, she begins to fear that the baby isn't her daughter at all. 
and despite her best efforts, history is repeating itself. Soon images of a black-haired woman plague Olivia's nightmares, drawing her back to the well that almost claimed her life, tying mother and daughter together in a desperate cycle of fear and violence that must be broken if Olivia has any hope of saving her child or herself. Baby Teeth meets the invited in a haunting story of the sometimes fragile connection between a woman's sense of self and what it means to be a good mother. Next up we have No One Needs to Know by Lindsay Cameron and this is rich people drama. Who likes rich people drama? When an anonymous neighborhood forum gets hacked, the darkest secrets of New York's wealthiest residents come to light, including some worth killing for. Urban myth. It was lauded as an alternative to the performative show your best self platforms, an anonymous discussion board grouped by zip code. The residents of Manhattan's exclusive Upper East Side disclosed it all, things they would never share with their friends or their spouses, secret bank accounts, steamy affairs, tidbits of juicy gossip. These are the same parents who would go to astonishing lengths to ensure their children gain admission to the most prestigious boarding schools and universities. So when a hacktivist group breaks into the forum and exposes the real identity behind each poster, the repercussions resound down Park Avenue with a force none could have anticipated, and someone will end up dead. Will it be Heather, the outsider who would do anything to get her daughter into the elite's good graces and into even better schools? Nora, the high-powered suit, failing to balance work and the emotional responsibilities of motherhood? Why am I talking so fast? <laughs> Nora, the high-powered suit, failing to balance work and the emotional responsibilities of motherhood. Or Poppy, perfect on the outside, but hiding more than her share of secrets. Each of them has something to hide. Each of them will do anything to keep their secrets hidden. And each of them just might kill to protect their own. Our last book releasing May the 9th is A Queer Horror, and this is another one that is paying homage to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and it's called Our Hideous Progeny by C.E. McGill. Mary is a great niece of Victor Frankenstein. She knows her great uncle disappeared in mysterious circumstances in the Arctic, but she doesn't know why or how. The 1850s is a time of discovery, and London is ablaze with the latest scientific theories and debates, especially when a spectacular new exhibition of dinosaur sculptures opens at the Crystal Palace. Mary, with a sharp mind and a sharper tongue, is keen to make her name in this world of science, alongside her geologist husband Henry. But without wealth and connections, their options are limited. But when Mary discovers some old family papers that allude to the shocking truth behind her great uncle's past, she thinks she may have found the key to securing their future. Their quest takes them to the wilds of Scotland, to Henry's intriguing but reclusive sister Maisie, and to a deadly chase with a rival who's out to steal their secret. So if you like Frankenstein, there are two very different novels this month that you could reach for. And I know with this one, it does say that since it's the 1850s, poor Mary is super intelligent, but obviously women were not as respected, if at all, at that time when it came to academics, keeping true to the time period. But other than that, I'm not sure what the heck else is going on in this novel. The cover is so pretty. I don't really know. Wait, what's going on in the cover? Are those like little eggs? I don't know what's going on in the cover. There's a scary eye. I'm really curious about what those eggs are and what's hatching out of those eggs. Does it have anything to do with that dinosaur exhibition that, that came into town? Are those dinosaur eggs? Is there a dinosaur in this? Let me know if you read that. The next book is releasing May 12th, and this is a psychological mystery thriller called The Girl Who Vanished by R.M. Ward. Frances Brookman has just received the phone call every mother dreads. Her daughter Naomi has been in a life-threatening accident. As she races to the hospital, Frances catches sight of a child in another car, a girl screaming help. It's a split second thing and looks can be deceptive. She could follow the car, but can she live with a delay getting to her daughter? And if she does nothing, can she live with herself? What interesting premise of racing to the hospital to get to your daughter. Also seeing another child in a car mouthing the word help screaming. That's a horrible dilemma to explore in the book, first of all. But second, with the psychological mystery or thriller aspect of it, this is told in multiple point of views. One being Francis, our main character, and then another being Naomi, who is her daughter that was injured. And Naomi is worried about Francis because dementia runs in their family. Her mother is telling her this tale about seeing 
this child that she is positive is being abducted and kind of obsessing over the child and obsessing over the person that was driving the car. Naomi isn't really convinced that any of this really happened. Is it all in Francis's mind? So I think that's what really intrigued me is I just, I love when the narrator is unreliable and there could be two paths we take. There's a bird uh, attacking my window. Okay. <laughs> this next book is releasing May 16th and it's called Killing Me by Michelle Gagnon. And this was described as a laugh out loud, funny thriller where you may have to suspend your disbelief. It might be a little over the top. It says she escaped a serial killer. Then things got weird. Amber Jameson cannot believe she's about to become the latest victim of a serial killer. She's savvy and street smart. So when she gets pushed into, of all things, a white windowless van, she's more angry than afraid. Things get even weirder when she's miraculously saved by a mysterious woman who promptly disappears. Who was she and why is she hunting serial killers? You'd think escaping one psychopath would be enough, but Amber's problems are just beginning. Her close call has law enforcement circling a past she's tried to outrun. So she's forced to flee across the country, ending up at a seedy motel in Las Vegas with a noir-obsessed manager and a sex worker as her unlikely companions. And danger is right behind. Mind. She's landed in the crosshairs of the world's most prolific killer, caught up in a deadly game that's been going on for years. To survive, she's forced to dust off her old playbook and partner with someone she can't trust. The odds are against her, but sometimes you just have to roll the dice. Kind of like a what the heck synopsis, but also knowing that this is going to be a little cheeky, a little funny. I am actually really looking forward to that. And I just want to say I'm so sad that none of these books I'm talking about were May Book of the Month picks. I'm so sad because I feel like this one would have been perfect. I mean, look at the cover. This is like the perfect Book of the Month cover. These next books are releasing May 23rd. The first one is a political slash domestic thriller called The Senator's Wife by Liv Constantine. And that's actually the pin name of the sister duo, Lynn and Valerie Constantine. So how cool is that? After a tragic chain of events led to the deaths of their spouses two years ago, DC philanthropist Sloan Chase and Senator Whit Montgomery are finally starting to move on. The horrifying ordeal drew them together and now they're ready to settle down again with each other. As Sloan returns to the world of White House dinners and political small talk, this time with her new husband, she's also preparing for an upcoming hip replacement, the latest reminder of the lupus diagnosis she's managed since her 20s. With both of their hectic schedules, they decide that hiring a home health aide will give Sloan the support and independence she needs post-surgery, and they find the perfect fit in Athena Karras. Seemingly a godsend, Athena tends to Sloan and even helps her run her charitable foundation, but Sloan slowly begins to deteriorate. A complication, Athena explains, of Sloan's lupus. As weeks go by, Sloan becomes sicker and her uncertainty quickly turns to paranoia as she begins to suspect the worst. Why is Athena asking her so many probing questions about her foundation, about her past? And could Sloan be imagining the sultry looks between Athena and her new husband? Woo, drama. Who is Athena? Is she sleeping with Sloan's husband? What were the tragic chain of events that led to the deaths of their spouses? Is it connected? What's going on? If you like political thrillers, domestic thrillers, that looks like a good one. The next book I'm excited for because y'all know I love characters of a certain age and especially when those characters are spies or assassins, the perfect combo. So this one is Helen Warwick number one. It's called Second Shot by Cindy Dees. Retirement isn't easy for a former CIA assassin, and for 55-year-old Helen Warwick, it may be impossible. Even Helen's family doesn't know the true nature of the work she's done for decades. The secret black ops, the sanctioned executions, but her plan to spend time reconnecting with her grown children has just been blown up along with her son's house by hired killers. Why is she being targeted now and by whom? Years of eliminating the nation's enemies one sniper bullet at a time have earned Helen powerful adversaries. Then there are mysterious new foes, including a psychopath dubbed the Da Vinci Killer, who wages a twisted war with the rival serial killer to turn murder into art. And when he sets his sights on Helen, she may very well become his next exhibit. From homegrown spies to Russian mafia hitmen, Helen's ghosts don't just haunt, they kill. And staying alive long enough to make up for the past and protect those closest to her will take every ounce of skill she possesses. Um, yes, living for this John Wick style badass assassin 
55 year old. I read Killers of a Certain Age by Deanna Rayborn. That one just left me wanting more action. Otherwise, I really like the stories, love the characters. So this one seems like it will feature more action. She was like a top sniper, a top sniper assassin. So I love a good locked room mystery. And if it's set at a chateau, I'm usually sold. This one is actually called the Chateau by Jacqueline Goldis. A dream girl's trip to a luxurious French chateau devolves into a deadly nightmare of secrets and murder in this stylish, twisty thriller for fans of Lucy Foley, Ruth Ware, and Lisa Jewell. Welcome to picturesque province, where the lady of the chateau, Seraphine, has opened its elegant doors to her granddaughter, Darcy, and three friends. 20 years earlier, the four girlfriends studied abroad together in France and visited the old woman on the weekends, creating the group's deep bond. But why this sudden invitation? Amid winery tours, market visits, and fancy dinners overlooking olive groves and lavender fields, it becomes clear that each woman has a hidden reason for accepting the invitation. Then, after a wild evening celebration, Seraphine is found brutally murdered. As the women search for answers to the shocking crime, fingers begin pointing and a sinister Instagram account pops up, exposing snapshots from the friends' intimate moments at the chateau while threatening to reveal more. As they race to uncover who murdered Seraphine, they learn the chateau houses many secrets several worth killing for. So for me, we have four main suspects. Could it be just some rando? Sure. But we have Darcy and her three friends. I saw that we will read from all four of them at different points in the book. I love the cover. That's a must read for me. The next one is called Seeing Her Down. This one was giving me S.A. Cosby vibes. So hopefully it is a little bit of a gritty thriller. It describes itself as a feminist western thriller and it seems like this one might be calling itself that because there is potentially a showdown that's going to happen and because it's set in Arizona and then also set in LA might be why it's called western but otherwise I, I'm not really getting western vibes from it that's actually what stood out to me and then when I read the synopsis I was a little confused but it says Florence Florida Baum is not the hapless innocent she claims to be when she arrives at the Arizona women's prison or so her ex-cellmate Dios Mary Sandoval keeps insinuating. Dios knows the truth about Florida's crimes, understands the truth that Flores hides, even from herself, that she wasn't a victim of circumstance, an unlucky bystander misled by a bad man. Dios knows that darkness lives in women too, despite the world's refusal to see it, and she's determined to open Florida's eyes and unleash her true self. When an unexpected reprieve gives both women their freedom, Dios' fixation on Florida turns into a dangerous obsession, and a deadly cat and mouse chase ensues from Arizona to the desolate streets of Los Angeles. Very interesting, very interesting premise. Apparently, we have one character, Dios, who can see the hidden evil in our second Florence or Florida. She's going to take it upon herself to enact her own justice, it seems. I don't know. That screams summer read. I might have to pick that up and take that with me to the beach. I can already feel the oppressive heat. I can feel it. Next is a debut novel by Emma Rosenblum and it's called Bad Summer People. We had our rich people drama, now we have our bad people drama. So unlikable characters just getting into, just getting into trouble. None of them would claim to be a particularly good person, but who among them is actually capable of murder? Jen Weinstein and Laura Parker rule the town of Salcombe, Fire Island every summer. They hold sway on the beach and the tennis court, and are adept at manipulating people to get what they want. Their husbands, Sam and Jason, have summered together on the island since childhood, despite lifelong grudges and numerous secrets. Their one single friend, Rachel Wolf, is looking to meet her match, whether he's a tennis pro or someone else's husband. But even with plenty to gossip about, this season starts out as quietly as any other, until a body is discovered face down off the side of the boardwalk. Stylish, subversive, and darkly comedic, this is a story of what's lurking under the surface of picture-perfect lives in a place where everyone has something to hide. Next up is The Revenge List by Hannah Mary McKinnon. The people in Frankie Morgan's life says she's angry, emotionally stunted, combative, but really who can blame her? 
It's hard being nice when your clients are insufferable, your next door neighbor is a miserable woman, and the cowardly driver who killed your mother is still out living it up somewhere. Somehow though, she finds herself at her very first anger management group session, drinking terrible coffee and learning all about how forgiveness is a process. One that starts with a list. Frankie is skeptical, a list of everyone who's wronged her in some way over the years. More paper, please. Still, she makes the pointless list with her own name in a prominent spot and promptly forgets about it until it goes missing. And one by one, the people she's named start getting hurt in freak accidents, each deadlier than the last. Could it be coincidence giving her the revenge she never dared to seek or something more sinister? If Frankie doesn't find out who's behind it all, she might be next. The last two release on May the 30th and this one is another must read for me. It is by TJ Newman and it is called Drowning. TJ Newman was formerly a flight attendant and a bookseller and if the cover looks familiar it's because she released a book called Falling I think? But they both have very similar covers. In the first book, an airplane takes off, the pilot gets a message that his family has been held hostage. And if he does not crash the plane and kill everyone on it, his family will be murdered. But this one, the layers of anxiety that this book gives me, it says six minutes after takeoff, flight 1421 crashes into the Pacific Ocean. During the evacuation, an engine explodes and the plane is flooded. Those still alive are forced to close the doors, but it's too late. The plane sinks to the bottom with 12 passengers trapped inside. More than 200 feet below the surface, engineer Will Kent and his 11-year-old daughter, Shannon, are waist deep in water and fighting for their lives. Their only chance at survival is an elite rescue team on the surface, led by professional diver Chris Kent, Shannon's mother, and Will's soon-to-be ex-wife who must work together with Will to find a way to save their daughter and rescue the passengers from the sealed airplane, which is now teetering on the edge of an undersea cliff. <laughs> there's not much time, there's even less air. With devastating emotional power and heart-stopping suspense, Drowning is an unforgettable thriller about a family's desperate fight to save themselves and the people trapped with them. Wow, intense. I mean, now that sounds like a thriller. Our last book is a horror novel and it's called Cicadas Sing of Summer Graves by Quinn Connor. And Quinn Connor is described as one pin, two hands. It's actually two authors, Robin Barrow and Alex Cronin. This one is horror, but I also saw it described as magical realism and having a lot of fantastical elements, almost like a fairy tale. So consider that before you pick this up. It says, years ago, yellow fever gripped the small lakeside town of Prosper, Arkansas. At the height of that summer swelter, in the wake of an unexpected storm, the dam failed and the valley flooded, drowning the town and everyone trapped inside. The secrets of old Prosper drowned with them. Now decades later, when a mysterious locked box is pulled from the depths of the lake, three descendants of that long ago tragedy are hurled into another feverish summer, Cassie, the reclusive sole witness to an impossible horror no one believes, Lark, a wide-eyed dreamer haunted by bizarre visions, and June, caught between longing for a fresh start and bearing witness to the ghosts of the past. Bound together, all three must contend with their home's complex history and with the ruins of the town lost far beneath the troubled water. Those are all the books I'm looking forward to in May. Let me know if you pick any of those up. Let me know what you think about them. As always, thank you so much for watching. Y'all take care and I will see you in my next video.